Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Coming at you on uh, the first of a couple of consecutive off days. That's kind of nice. I'm I'm just going to say this at the top before I introduce our guest. I am happy. Yes, happy that there's no Friday Night Knicks. And you know why I'm happy? Because this week was a pain in my ass. And I want to get home on Friday. I want to open a bottle of wine. And I do not want to think about dissecting Julius Randle's efforts to be a good basketball player. Um, Can I jump in real quick? You know what's about to happen, right? A gigantic trade is going to happen tomorrow at like noon. That I wouldn't gonna, mind. I, we'll have like fine. a large live stream and an emergency newsletter. All of the above is going to happen, completely yeah. ruining it. And as somebody who also experienced this pain in the ass week, I also am looking forward to a Friday <laughs> night of nothing. Shout out to our significant others, who I'm sure are also yes. looking forward to a Friday night of nothing. Real Hashtag real talk. Um, all right. Uh, our guest today is one of... The newest contributors to Knicks Film School. Um, you've probably, if you are listening to this um, this podcast, have come across him in whether it's Twitter or, as Andrew tells me, the comment section on some of our YouTube programming. You can find his work at Xavier J Designs. Um, XJ, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing great, John. How are you? What's going on? Sounds like not the best, but you know, it, it, it's not. Listen, you, one day you don't have. I should know this. You don't have kids, do you? I do not have kids. God I'm bless thankful you. for that. I have a little puppy, and that's about it. Stick with the puppy. That's it. Get all your get all of your enjoyment out of the puppy. Uh, no, it's like when you have a busy when there's a busy week for me, and and then the the you know the children are being children. It's, it's it adds up. You know, you'll see. You'll see one day. we far into the future. Maybe. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> maybe you're convincing me not to see. I don't know. No, don't. Don't, don't let me do that. Don't put that on me. I don't want to. I, I, on behalf of your wh- whoever your future significant other is who is going to want kids, because trust me, there will be a future significant other who wants kids. Um, but I digress. So I want to start here because Andrew um, does everything ties my shoes, chews my gum for me, and then hands it over to me. Um, and he obviously f- mined uh, all of the new talent that we have. And so I was talking to him the other day about like YouTube. And I was like, hey, do we ever get any like comments on our YouTube shows? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, actually we do. XJ, he's, it was hilarious. It was like, did do people thing. ever give us feedback? I was like, yes, John. <laughs> There's like hundreds of comments usually, especially last season when it was much more high, hot oh tempered and hot buttoned, you know? Oh, I was so, there but, for it. Yes, I know. Well, so so he said, he's like, that's where I found XJ. He was always interacting and going back and forth with people in the YouTube comments. So I guess I want to start there. Like, what what did, is that, is that your preferred method of like, you know, dialoguing? That's not a word about, about this team. Is arguing and debating in YouTube comments? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. No, I, I would say like I'm a very chill guy, you know, pretty laid back, but I love debating and arguing points. I just really do. Um, I love having an opposing argument from someone and laying out all the reasons why the conclusions that I've drawn are more accurate or give a better map onto reality than theirs do. I really enjoy it. So, you know, I'd be in the comments going back and forth with some people, but If I ever commented on the YouTube videos, I'd make sure to put forward my best arguments with supporting data and logical analysis that I used to form it. And uh, Mr. Mr. Claudio, Mr. GMAC would sometimes respond and we'd go back and forth a little bit. It was it was really fun. So, yeah, you had a lot of feedback in the comments, mainly mainly uh, mainly uh, motivated by me, I would say. But, you know, it, it was good. Good stuff. I remember those days when I first joined Twitter and I was like, I'm just going to get involved. Anybody who responds to me, I'm just going to go right back at it. You know, you know, my two, you might know this, Andrew. I don't know if you do. My two earliest, most frequent debaters on Twitter who I would get involved with stuff with were Schwinn, as should surprise no one, and Dave Early. Shout out to Liberty Ballers. Um, we always used to get into it on the merits of tanking versus not tanking. Um, that's a that's a thing XJ and I got into I, it, uh, it in is. the comments. Yeah, are you pro tank XJ? I'm generally pro tank. This season I wouldn't be, but generally I'm pro tank. It makes sense. It's very rational to me. I think one of the big 
arguments that Andrew and I had was about last year tanking. And I said, I said, you got to get to the seventh spot um, in the lottery. Otherwise, there's no point, right? If you're going to be eight, nine, 10, it doesn't even matter because the odds shift so rapidly once you get to seven. I'm, and then could, yes, yeah. what do you find out? Who gets seven is uh, the who got seven. The Kings got seven, right. And they, and they jumped up. They um, jumped to four. And then on lottery night, when I saw that, I was like, ah, damn, Max J was right. <laughs> and you gave literally my out, and so. I gave you the shout out. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know what? See, everything you said about him is right because I, the other thing I was going to talk about is how you're extraordinarily data driven. And like, I'm so happy you brought that up because I thought I was like the only person who noticed, like, man, there really is a steep drop off. Like, if you're in that five, that's really the flat and lottery odds have, have really only helped that in the, I would say, what, the five, six, seven range? Like, right, right there. That's where yep. you want to be now. Yep. Well, you know, if you can't, if you can't be in the, you know, in the, in the top four. Um, I like how the, in the big, I, would you, do you pay attention to a lot of the reporting or are you just like, you, you, you dive into the data or you're, you're both. I'm data first. I look at some reporting, but I, I'm not well-rounded. I'm a data driven guy. You're data driven you know, guy. Through, yeah. I, so maybe you won't appreciate this as much, but I like how in, in Ian's, uh, Ian Bagley's report from whatever it is now, by the time people listening to this two days ago, uh, he made sure to specify <laughs> There will be no intentional tanking happening within the walls of Madison Square Garden this year. <laughs> for all you, for all you Alan Suppenwalds out there, you get, keep your tank gifts in 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 the folder for another another season. Well, I would say I don't even think they're capable of tanking this year because what would that even look like? Like, how would they accomplish a tank? I there's one move that I, but it's not going to. I mean, if they if you bench Jalen Brunson, if you basically SGA. Oh, yeah. Jalen Brunson. Um, I fi- I mean, again, they, it's not going to happen because of this owner and this this front office. But like, if you let Brunson make his All Star bid, if he makes it, great. If he doesn't make it, whatever. And then you shut him down. Like, what's the worst record they could have at the fifty game mark? Do you think realistically? The absolute worst. I'd have to look at the schedule, but you know, I could see them with thirty losses. I was going to say like 23 and 27, but yeah, you're, I think you might be closer to being right. If like, if things really, if they had some other injury, bad luck or whatever, yeah, maybe 20 and 30. So if if you were 20 and 30 and you shut Brunson down, that's a, that gets you at the five, six, seven, I think, even with the, with the real aggressive tankers that are going to be coming hot and heavy pretty soon. Well, that's the issue, right? Like, other teams are going to be really tanking <laughs> and they ain't waiting for the 50 game mark. and they're not waiting for the 50 game mark to shut down Jalen Brunson. So no, it's going to be yeah. tough. Um, you like Brunson? Have you liked watching Brunson this year? Love Brunson. Love watching him this year. Love that his contract looks like one of the best contracts in the NBA right now. I love all of it. I'm, I'm here for it. Um, you know, I think what I'm seeing is that, at this point, he's probably going to opt out when he's able to, but that's a success, oh, right? Like yeah. signing that deal when you, you give him that player option. And if he opts out of that, you just signed a great, amazing deal. So I love it. I think it's going to be great for the team moving forward. I wish there was more space on the court for him to operate, but you know, maybe we can talk about that in a second. Too. Well, let, no, let, let's get to it now because Andrew gave me a couple of topics that he wanted me to hit on with you. Cause I, I know you guys talk a lot more than, than we do. Um, the first of which is Obi Toppin and Julius Randle. So as you may know from this summer, I planted my flag on trade Julius Randall Island. Like, I don't care what you get. Does not matter to me. You could tell me he comes out and has a really good year for him. And I would actually argue, could, like, could we have reasonably expected a better year on offense from him? I don't know. think so, right? No, this is, this is the best season offensively of his career, I would argue. And the data definitely supports oh, that. A hundred percent. Um, it's amazing what happens when you have a modern shot profile. Even if you, what it turns out, it's better to be pretty good at a modern shot profile than be like as good as possible at a completely archaic shot profile. Um, who would have thunk it? Um, so anyway, that was my flag that I planted, and I had my reasons for it. And you know, I don't need to rehash those. But I, I, I guess you have some pretty strong feelings on the matter as well. I absolutely. And I absolutely agree with you on it, really. When it comes down to it, I don't care how well Julius plays on offense. I think he's a detriment to the team, especially defensively. I think that that's inarguable at this point. Um, You know, and 
just blocking Obi Toppin is huge. It doesn't make sense that they drafted him if they were going to use him this way. Um, you know, starting from the beginning, I'm just going to kind of chronicle my Obi Toppin fandom for you, John, just so you could get really, you could get the background on it. So, so I don't really watch much college basketball, but you know, doing the customary pre-draft review of scouting reports and, you know, looking at draft express videos on YouTube, I was like, I would love if the Knicks drafted Obi Toppin when he was coming out of college, his shot look, his shot looked great. His explosiveness was elite. His basketball feel looked tremendous. Um, and, you know, some of those things are notoriously hard to teach. So when they got him, I was ecstatic. Right. And then we look back in its rookie season. First around 30 games of his career, I was shocked at how lost he looked. Like I thought he might not be an NBA player on both ends of the court. Right. After 30 games. But then after that, he started coming around and you could really start to see his feel for the game, his subtle basketball intelligence play out, his confidence start to grow, his energy and his cutting and his outlets were really helping the team, you know, around the margins. Um, But a lot of people had already made their assessments based on those first initial few games. And it's really hard for people to change their opinions once they establish them, right? Like we're all subject to biases, like confirmation bias and status quo bias, all those kinds of things. So being the comment warrior that I am, you know, I started arguing with people that you could see Obi turning around. You could see his potential that his jumper would come. That's something that Andrew and I debated back and forth about Um, and that his energy was consistently having an effect on the team. And the advanced numbers were already starting to show his and reflect his quiet impact on team success, which is what I care about. I don't care about counting stats. I don't care about per minute stat. I don't care about any of that. Um, uh, per game stats. I don't care about any of that. I care about impact, right? Um, so then last year, he fully confirmed what seemed to be showing glimpses of, right? His offense last year was excellent. Per 75 uh, possessions, numbers were off the charts. Efficiency off the charts. The only thing that was missing was a three-point shot, which I had full confidence would come around, but I just felt like he needed more minutes. He needed more confidence. He needed more space. He needed you know, the coaching staff to kind of put him into better positions. And they couldn't do that. I think that they were hamstrung a little bit by the roster construction. So, you know, I agree with you in that way, John. It's not all Tibbs. It's front office. It's roster construction. It didn't work out. Randall or Toppin has to go. It's always been that way. I think it has to be that way. And unfortunately, I think it's going to be Toppin that goes. But I I hate that. You know, I really do. I hate it, too. Because and it, it's like so I was on the the putback earlier today with with Ian and, and Steph Bondi and Steph actually brought up like, you know, and a lot of people have brought this point up like this front office is pretty clearly just continuing to kick the can down the road. And, and I think what I certainly did not give enough credence to was how how much collateral damage could happen along the way as you're trying to build a functional, coherent roster, mm-hmm. um, as you kick that can. But even as I say that, it, that's not, it's not just like anyone trying to d- kick can down the road in a vacuum is going to have to experience that collateral damage because it's what happens when you invest a lot of money in, in veteran players. And then that gets us back to whether you want to say the decision not to trade Randall when Leon took over, the decision to extend Randall, the decision perhaps not to explore trades at I don't know what they could have got for him last deadline, 50 cents on the dollar, 65, whatever cents on the dollar, like all of these little pivot points along the way, there have been pivot points, but they have their eye on that future prize, which is, uh, you know, using Randall's salary and a trade for an, a talent upgrade, as opposed to let's, you know, worry about our roster right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, 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 I guess they've ass- assessed internally that if Obi Toppin is the, is the collateral damage, then we're fine with that. Which like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, Oh, that's definitely the wrong decision because this is, this guy is worth so much more investment than that. But like, it just, that can't be good team building, you know? Absolutely. And I think the collateral damage point is a critical point because I think there's a lot of collateral damage happening. I don't think it's just a top in. Um, and I think you're right. I think the front office and the executive staff of this organization doesn't care about collateral damage. Um, you know, I think that it's kind of weird, but when you think about it, this front office is drafted extremely well. It's the thing that they've done the best, in my opinion. When you talk about getting quickly with the 25th pick, you talk about getting Grimes with the 25th pick, you talk about getting McBride with 36th pick and Jericho Sims with the 58th pick. This <laughs> is an amazing track record for drafting, but you only get value out of draft picks when they play because once their contract comes up and they get paid 
that doesn't matter where they got drafted. They get paid for what they produce during the time that they were on their rookie deal. And so you need to get value out of those guys while they're on their rookie deal. And I think this kicking the can down the road and having guys kind of block minutes for guys like quickly guys like Grimes, even though Grimes is getting his minutes now, um, you know, I think it, it, it's deleterious to the impact, uh, to the success of the team in the long term, in the long term. So I think the collateral damage point is huge. And I don't think the front office cares about that. I think that's a mistake. I, I keep trying to tell myself that they're just biding their time and they, and they are the, they are, they are convinced that there will be a deal for Randall that will materialize. And then I, and then I wake up and I realize, like, no, that's not actually going to be the thing that happened. I mean, but at the same time, here's the one thing I will say, and I'll go back to the whole reporting aspect. And this is why I think it is important to pay attention to like what gets reported. You know, Ian, Ian was pretty clear over the summer, or at least it seemed like to me, he was clear that there is an either or situation potentially happening with quickly and top and where they, are going to roll forward with one or the other. And then since then there's been the quickly trade reports. So that's like the one part where I'm like, you know what, maybe they really are going to at some point see what they have in this kid, but that gets back to his usage and like how they're using him. And like, this is the other thing I want to ask you about. Cause I know you've thought about Obi Toppin a lot. I, I am of the belief that he, he should be playing. I don't know. Eight. 10, 12 minutes a game at the five and not a five alongside Julius Randall, but as a five alongside, I guess on this roster, it would be Cam Reddish. You know, they were already playing RJ with the backups, uh, you know, quickly Grimes, you know, pick one it would probably be quickly because quickly comes off the bench. And then Jalen Brunson, who's been running with those bench units and have absolutely, I looked up the numbers earlier today with Brunson plus OB bench. Oh my Lord. They're, those those teams are like are breaking basketball and obviously it's not a huge sample size and they're coming against other backups but like that's what i want to see from obi Toppin for at least part of his time and i i just don't know is that realistic to to ever expect so i totally agree with that i would love to see obi at the five in those situations without julius next to him and i don't know if we've seen a minute of that this year or ever probably not is what i would guess um but the thing- <laughs> if it has happened i forgot it yeah, I, I, I think I would have remembered because I would have it would have been a eureka moment for me. But um, I would love to see it. And even when Toppin does play the five with Julius, he's playing like a stretch five, right? He's still playing the same role. He He's not taking advantage or we're not taking advantage of the space that's created by having both those guys out there. Um, Julius can stretch the floor, man. He's in he's in those open threes at a, at a decent clip. And having those guys spaced out, I would love to see Obi and more of like, I've been given this uh, comp a lot, the Lowry marketing role. You know, I think, I think if Obi went to Utah for Donovan, he would be having a very similar year to Lowry marketing. You know, that might seem high, but he does a lot of things very similarly. Well, he slashes to the basket. He has great feel. He can finish around the rim. He can shoot the three. Well, he's, he thrives in space. Um, you know, his handle is not as great as Lowry, as Lowry, but He's more explosive. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would love to see this team spread it out, put Obi at the five, maybe RJ with him at the four, maybe Cam with him at the four, at least for a few minutes of, of the game. You know, you can set pin downs for him to curl around uh, or spot up behind. He can post up smaller players. They can space out and run pick and rolls for him. They can even put more offensive load on his back. We saw what he did towards the end of the season last year, dropping 42, dropping 35 and really highly efficient minutes. So, you know, I would just love to see it, but I don't think we're going to see that kind of experimentation. Although I will say I have to give tips credit for a lot of the lineups that he's tried this year. And Andrew has been the one to bring me along on this and, and, and has absolutely convinced me to give tips some credit here. Uh, but yes, I, I would love to see even more. I would love to see even more. Andrew. Yes, John. Any, any, you just sounded like you wanted to no, say. I just, so this is the thing, like I've become the you of the pregame show where that's it's a, like, it's not all Tibbs' yes. fault. And it's funny. Then I'll go to you sometimes and bring up reasonable criticism because I think there is a middle ground. I think Benji hit it a couple of weeks ago, or I guess last week, actually, where it was like, we can say there's reasonable things I wish he did differently, things, some principles that I wish he wouldn't hold so strong to that might actually lead to a higher ceiling with this team, but not call for his head every time he doesn't 
close with the lineup that you wanted or play Obi top in three fewer minutes than you wanted but, him to like, but, it's a, it's a yin and yang. I think at this point where me, it's, it's become, I, it's very simple. Why are you getting, why are you getting stressed out about the symptom? Get mad about the virus, you know? And that, like that, that gets to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, you mm -hmm. know, but again, he's, he's not perfect. He's going to do things that are maddening, but um, there's other stuff going on here. I, um, I don't know. I don't know. Will, will we ever will we ever get to see something like that? I, I hope we do. And I, but just to, to close on the, the the Obi loop, like this is part of. And I don't want to. I don't want to get into RJ because I feel like all we do is talk about RJ. But like one of the things I have against you know folks who are so 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 you know standing so hard for for RJ is like this guy has been given every opportunity like talk put the ball in his hands and I, I understand many of those opportunities have not been ideal you know rewind back to 2019 20 his rookie year where they had the worst spacing in the history of basketball i get that but like to allow yourself the opportunity to get into a rhythm and to like feel your way through and know that you're going to get a 30 usage rate in a, every in a game after a game after a game after a game what would that look like for obi Toppin? and like we just don't we don't know what the answer is you know and i i think of all of between that's that's why like I'm here for the quickly conversation though like what could quickly be with 30 plus minutes tonight but like it that's not as interesting for me personally as the OB what would he look like with 30 plus minutes tonight I think the biggest indictment on Tibbs is Obi Toppin right like I think you can justify some of the other stuff you know the lineups and all these other things and I think he's shown some flexibility on all these things but the OB stuff is like you haven't tried to really emphasize him as a focal point of the offense. Nope. Um, you know, and I think there's another aspect of it, which is that he doesn't really coach Obi how I think Obi needs to be coached. Like being worried about missing shots or making mistakes and only playing a few minutes here and there doesn't allow him to get into a rhythm and impacts his confidence. And what we've seen from Obi is that he's a confidence player. Yep. He needs to have confidence. When he's confident, he plays really well. He takes chances. He hits his shots. When he's you know, kind of being bashful and within himself and is not confident. He makes mistakes. He turns it over. He gets bullied on the defensive yep. end, like all kinds of things. It, it, and I don't know why it seems like he and quickly are really big confidence players. When they're confident, they play amazingly well. Oh yeah. And when they're low on confidence, that goes out the window. So I just think, you know, if he had a coach who was in his ear, like telling him, you know, you're doing great, take the shots that you're given attack, you know, don't, don't pass it when you don't need to like, don't, I, I think that he just needs that kind of coaching and we're not going to see that with the Knicks. So I think it's almost better for his career to not be in New York as sad as it makes me to say. You know, it's yeah. fun, real quick, yeah. you know, it's funny XJ. I think the John, you'd agree with this too. The two biggest indictments of Tibbs go hand in hand because it'd be OB and, and then right. it'd be Julius Randall you know, how he's handled him. Now, the first season, we were fine with him empowering him to be the main focal point of that offense. And then last season, he never corralled it back and leaned a little more toward Obi. And this season, it's really just a defensive end. Like, how have you not pointed out the mistakes that he's making on defense? And if there's no changing know. it, then why haven't we seen a reduction in playing time when Obi has shown that more yeah. playing time for him I was about, they, the two biggest things that I would have a criticism of him for, they go, you know, perfectly well together. I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I, I want to know what happens. I wish I was a fly on the wall when the team is in the film room, you know, they're mm -hmm. chilling, oh they're talking God. about how can we improve our 30th percentile defense in the NBA? Right. And then the sequence of plays that John put out on his newsletter comes on where Julius <laughs> is, he's not making mistakes, but he's not even trying. Right. What happens in that moment? Well, it, it, the popcorn defense, right? What happens in that moment is Tibbs is just like not saying, do they all just look down and act like nothing happened? Do they say, oh, don't worry about it, Jew. We, we need your energy for offense. You know, like don't, don't, it's all good. <laughs> what happens? I, I'm so confused about that. I think it's like, you know, a lot of, a lot of marriages of convenience in this country where it is understood that like things will go on outside of the home, you know, okay. perhaps behind closed doors. And we're just going to look the other way to have a happy, you know, make sure we have a happy, uh, happy appearance to anyone who who looks in from the outside. I think that's it. I think that's just kind of look the other way and you know, pretend it's not going on. Um, I don't have another expert. I, 
I, that, I it literally that, that is my best guess because it's, it's it's maddening. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't I don't know what they do there. Um, it feels like they need to do something. I would I would be shocked if these guys are both on the team next year. Would you? Absolutely shocked. Yeah. I, I can't see it happening. I think, you know, like I said multiple times, I think Obi's going to be the one out. I don't see them trading Julius. If Julius plays poorly, he has no trade value and they can't move him. If he plays well, they love him and want to retain him. So I don't, I, I don't, I don't see them being able to ever trade him. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm going to, I'm going to keep hope alive for my, my dreams to come true. Um, let's say, well, who, who, who else is, so I know Obi is the guy you really want to talk about. Who, who else is interesting to you on this roster that you think, whether it's something that you found in like the stats or some data that's interesting to you, like who, who do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. I mean, we can talk about, we can talk about quickly because I recently did a pretty deep dive into his shooting when he was going through one of his slumps. That. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just looked at his career shooting and kind of looked at how he shoots on catch and shoot, pull up, open threes, wide open threes, tightly contested, just like throughout his career. And um, what we see is that for some unexplained reason, he just goes through these lulls. He just goes through like really strange 10 game shooting slumps Um, outside of those slumps. If you kind of pull those away and it's still a sizable sample, he's an excellent shooter. He's like a high end shooter for a guard. And I think that's who he is. I think he has to do something about those slumps. I don't know if this year had anything to do with him bulking up. I mean, this hmm. some, you know, they have these urban legends about like, you know, lifting too many weights will affect your jump shot. I don't know if that's true. And I don't know if that's supported by the data, but I, it just doesn't really make sense why he goes through these slumps. But I think that the biggest thing that I noticed about quickly is that coming out of the draft, I looked back at his scouting report and, um, you know, it said, if this guy could play defense, he'd be a top 10 pick. The issue with quickly <laughs> is that he's not a defensive player and that he's going to get exploited in the NBA, but his shooting is there. His shooting is, is, is always going to be there and they're not worried about him at the offensive end. He's a bucket, but it's his defense and look at it. Now he turned his biggest weakness into his biggest strength. His defense is now, at least it has been so far this season, elite guard defense in the NBA. Yep. Um, so I just think I believe in his shooting, just like I believed in OB shooting. I believe in more in Emmanuel quickly shooting, look at his free throw shooting throughout his college career and his NBA career. Look at his form and everything looks great. I just, I think that the shooting's going to become consistent at some point. And then now you have a really great, though small, um, two way player. And so like, I'm so high on quickly and I'm just, I'd be really sad if they moved them for like a late first round pick or something that seems like they might do quickly. Here's the, here's the difference between quickly and Obi for me. And I, 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 we've spent so much time talking about, I don't know why it always does turn into like an either or with these, with these guys, but it, it feels like that's off on the conversation. But like, I, I do think the thing with Obi is that you need to finagle your roster rotation system like a lot of different things around his skill set and even if you do that i think even the biggest ob fan would probably acknowledge there are still going to be question marks about how what that looks like and again these are not conversations we need to be having now but like what does that look like in the playoffs and against you know when you have to, when teams are game planning against this guy and things of that nature of the two Quickly is the guy that scares me more about if we trade him away, I'm going to be watching him in a fucking game seven, you know, of some of a conference finals or something out there. And like, oh, yeah, there's quick Emmanuel quickly putting up 22 on whoever, you know, uh, or like maybe that's a bit extreme. But like if the if all we're talking about, right, is the shooting, which is like if the shot's there and the, and his shot is going to be as good as I think a lot of us figured it would be. And a lot of us still think it might be. Well, then why can't this guy play 25 minutes a night at the very least for pretty much any team in basketball. And especially when you think about the fact that there are so many teams now as has probably been the case for a while now in the NBA that run their offense to a certain extent through these big wings where you might be able to have Emmanuel quickly as the smallest player on the floor so that his physical limitations are minimized. And he could, you know, if like, if he's your weakest defender, that's a good freaking spot to be in. And, and, that, and so that's my fear at this point, actually. 
I have a very similar fear. You know, I, I just hate that feeling when it's like you had a guy and you gave him away and now he's performing in a big spot and you see his potential actually realized for another team. That's the worst feeling to me. I don't want to experience that. I don't want to see him moved. And, and to be honest, like, you know, I, I I do not want to make this a, a kill tips kind of thing, but you know, quickly last year, got 23 minutes per game. Mm-hmm. And I imagine he goes to Tibbs and he says, you know, coach, how do I get on the court for more minutes? Like, what can I do to like show you that I deserve, you know, to play 30 minutes a game? And Tibbs is like, well, you got to improve your defense. You can't be a weakness. You can't be a liability on that end. You got to be able to guard elite guards in this game. Quickly says, okay, comes back next summer after the next <laughs> summer. Does that. Gets 22.5 minutes per game. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, we talked about this on some of the pregame shows. The Knicks offense is actually really good, despite the poor shooting from three. Um, so I, and I give tips a lot of credit for that. You know, I think the Knicks are getting really good shots. They take open shots. They have good profile shot profile, good shot diet from almost everybody on the team. Um, and I think that's a collective effort. I think that's great, but you know, I don't see why quickly has to have 22 and a half minutes per game. I think he can get a lot more. I think his defense keeps him on the court. I think he has a majorly positive impact that every single advanced metric likes quickly the best on the team, like every single one, EPM, Raptor, uh, ESPN's RPM, every single metric. And that, you know, that takes into account the fact that he's a bench player playing against bench players on the other squad. Like it accounts for those differences and that's what they're meant to do. So, you know, I really think he should get more time. I would have him have more time over Rose minutes or, you know, even over cam extra cam minutes if it if it came down to it so that's 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 the thing for me i, I think i might be the highest on quickly i to me it goes back to the roster construction issue to a certain extent because again you're talking about a team that has rj barrett and cam reddish on it two guys who i i think again not saying for like 48 minutes a game or even like 24 minutes a game, but like for some portion of the game, you should be able to play guys like that. If you just look around the league today and you look at the, the lineups are being run out with guys who who's playing the four, like you should be able to get away with, I don't know, a dozen or 15 minutes a game with those guys playing the four. And if you do that, then you can, everybody else slots up. And then to me, that is your path to 30 Emmanuel quickly minutes. Um, and that, can't happen right now, which is why it, it turns into a more uncomfortable conversation because the, the one thing I, and I know you've seen these numbers is like the, the numbers with quickly where he is the only, like the lead ball handler where he's not alongside a, another point guard. Like those numbers are not great, which I, I'm not going to kill him for that at all. But so I, I do like him out there with another, like with a lead ball handler. I agree. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. It, you know, but, and man, again, Talk about numbers with him and Brunson world setting the world on fire. I mean, those are, those are, those are great lineups and we don't see nearly enough of them because of, of, you know, reasons. Um, I think you're right. I actually want to ask you, do you think Hartenstein is kind of the clogger here and and everything that you're saying, it's like, if we had one fewer center who didn't need that many minutes, we could, all these, uh, these opportunities would be unlocked. We play Obi at the five and we play cam at the four. I I wasn't going to bring this up. (laughs) I really want to hear your opinion on it. I wasn't going to bring it up, but since I'm so, I'm actually, can I tell you something? I'm so proud of myself for this. Um, I was looking at, all of the bunch of numbers today for uh, a newsletter that's coming out tomorrow. And like, I've, I've reached that conclusion basically, which is that I think Isaiah Hartenstein should probably not be on this team. And I, I like Isaiah Hartenstein a lot. I think he's really good. And I think because he's really good and because he has a really wonderful skill set, he should be on a team that utilizes that skill set, which is not 2022, 23 New York Knicks under uh, God bless his soul, Tom Thibodeau. And the trade I thought of was, and there's a part of this that I don't love, but I'll, I'll talk you through it is sending him to golden state. Um, and because I think in their the way they play, he makes a lot of sense. Now, unfortunately they don't have a lot of easily movable salary. And for, if they wanted to acquire, um, uh, Isaiah Arnstein, they would have to give up one of their prize kids. The trade I concocted, 
and I'm pretty sure this works under the cap would, would be, it would, it would do what you just talked about a minute ago. Um, it would, it would free Obi Toppin. So you'd be sending Obi and Hardenstein to golden state for, I think I have it as like Kuminga and another small salary of theirs. That's or like, uh, I think Jermichael green or something. Um, it would be a, it would be an asset play. Cause like, I know Kuminga has not been good this year, but that is the trade I thought of. You you could kill me for it if you want. I, I, I honestly, I, okay. So I just want to say, I'll start with this in a recent pregame show. We talked about who would be the odd man out at center because we see all three of these centers there. And I said, Hartenstein, I felt like Hartenstein should be the one to sit and then he should get moved as soon as he's able to be, because I agree with a lot of your assessment. I think having one fewer center would really open up a lot of possibilities. And I think Hartenstein is not being used correctly. doesn't really make sense for him to be here if he's not going to be used correctly. He's not being used as a passer. They're not running offense through him. He would be amazing in Golden State. I love that as a destination for him. I don't know about that specific trade. Kaminga looks really bad and I don't he does. have like... He does. Sp- he looks horrible this year. I don't, I don't have like a special confidence in Jonathan Kaminga specifically. I haven't really seen anything besides the athleticism. He looks lost on the court a lot of times. Um, but, you know, I, I, I could see it. Obviously, you're breaking my heart putting Obi in that deal and, and, and I don't see the value play to move him at this point as part of that con- like deal. But, you know, I think Hartenstein and Golden State sounds really good. Would you rather move quickly to Golden State? Oh, absolutely not. No, <laughs> no, no. At this point, I'd rather move Obi to Golden State than quickly. That's why. That's why I went with that because there's a version of the deal. It's a little harder to pull off because quickly doesn't make as much um, as much money. But um, there's a version you could do a version of the deal with quickly. I just don't think you're getting Kuminga um, if you don't give up one of quickly or Obi. I mean. Can I interest you in a, a lightly used Moses Moody? Is that that's harder too <laughs> because he uh, he he's a make nearly as much money as Kuminga. Kuminga is the linchpin, and that's why I was just thinking like, and and like that th- th- we could end on this like for you know where the Knicks are at, and like we thought they're not tanking. You know we're, we're going to hope uh, it's a hope and a prayer for like a superstar. Like how else can you materially change your trajectory as a franchise? And I feel like maybe one of these, you know, like an undervalued, not an undervalued talent play. That's the wrong word because Kuminga is not an undervalued talent. He is a talent that has just not been good, but like taking a chance on one of these, like a a high pedigree young player that has not worked out for whatever reason in another organization. And like, there aren't that many of them out there. That's why I like was kind of proud of myself that I'm like, Oh, Kuminga, there's a guy who like excited a lot of people not too long ago. And, you know, but I, I hear you though. No, I think I think that's totally fair. Like theoretically, from a philosophical perspective, I totally agree. I think, you know, it could just be a fit issue, just like I think Obi is a fit issue here right now. Um, and that is a better fit for him as well. I I tweeted out a while ago, like uh, I was looking at some Dayton Flyer clips of uh, Obi Toppin and there was one clip where he 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 was in the corner and he kind of like jab step, jab step, actually did like a step back and then hit a three and turned away from it. As the ball went through the net, <laughs> I was looking at the the opposing bench as the ball went through, and I tweeted out, and I was like, "The next splash, bro." Um, so, uh, so maybe this coincides with uh, with some of your thoughts here on him going to Golden State. No, I, I I could totally see it. I think philosophically, it makes sense. There could be a better fit for Kaminga here. So, you know, I don't hate it. I just at this point, I think Obi is going to move. So, it could be worse. It could definitely be worse. Here's what I know. I know. I think I know two things. One, like you said before, I don't want to see quickly or Obi for that matter, move for some bullshit for like, you know, a, a first round pick that, you know, is not going to be a good first round pick. It's going to be a late first round pick. I don't want to see that. Um, and I don't, I also don't want to see them. Like if you if you, if you attach them like, like whatever, if, it, if it's a Donovan Mitchell type trade and you're attaching them to try to get a player of that caliber, that's one thing that trade is not materialized. I don't think at least that trade is not materializing before the, this trade deadline. Maybe that is a summer thing. And maybe look that maybe they hold on to both of them until the summertime and they try to do the same thing that they tried to do this past summer. And, and maybe they pull it off. I, I don't, I don't know, but like to attach them to like an Evan Fournier, you know, contract and then bring back some completely uninspiring fucking vet. Like, please, God, don't no. do that. Don't do no. that. 
No, you're right. In terms of like, it's way better value play to get somebody who's like has blue chip pedigree as far as like a draft prospect like Kaminga, who just hasn't worked out. I'd much rather do that than than do what the Hawks did with Cam Reddish, which is kind of flip them for, you know, yes. late, very heavily protected first round pick that's going to turn into two seconds um, the year before he's going to be up for an extension. So I, you know, I don't want to do what the Hawks did with Cam Reddish and I'd rather do what you're suggesting. I don't want to do either probably, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, I think your way is, is definitely the preferred option, especially I, I, I could, I could be sold on Kaminga. I just don't feel like the value's there and maybe he'll turn around and be really good too. So that, that's always a possibility. So I don't hate it. I don't hate it. Well, let, okay. I'll take it. I'll take, I don't hate it. <laughs> um, this was good, man. This fly by. You're, you're a pleasure to talk to. We're, we're going to, we're going to have to do this again Appreciate in the that. not too distant future. Um, I will have to ask you since it's the first time you're on, but I'll, I would ask you this anytime anyway, uh, where can folks find you and your takes and thoughts and stuff and anything else? Yeah, I am at Xavier J Designs, and that is everywhere Twitter, Instagram, anywhere you go. That's the same tag that you can find me. And uh, yeah, hit me up on Twitter, if, especially if you want to start some data based, data informed arguments. I'm, I'd be happy to join you in that. So I don't go on as much these days. No, but no I, not, I, not, I, not I you, to, to the audience, to the <laughs> audience. Any, any, Hold I'm, on. I'm, I'm Hold taking on. all comers. <laughs> you don't go on as much these days. I've been going on a little bit of you, late. This season, you've been on more than no. Elon Musk. Okay. <laughs> uh, listen, I, I've been going on. I on. have you on push notifications, sir. I see all the times that you jump into arguments with the replies. Well, this no, season, no, 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 no. I am not, not jumping into any nowhere arguments near as the replies. first season. It's nowhere, nowhere near as much as you used to. Trust me. I, I agree with that. But I'm, I'm, I see you. I see you being like, oh, just pointing out it. RJ's effective field goal percentage is down to 45%. Every <laughs> okay, now you're just lying. Just making sure you notice that, by the way. I oh, wrote, this this uh, head coach that you don't think can coach defense, a uh, coach offense is up to 10th in the NBA. Just just putting this out there. That's like well, a I, Macri, like, like twit, tweet, twit, uh, Twitter generator that you yes, just created. Right it's there. literally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been, I have been tweeting. Uh -huh. I am not getting into it in no. replies to and, you know, to the and things I know I you're oblivious to this, but and next day, I think you might have seen it. Um, if you watched what happened on Nick's Twitter today, uh, it's a good thing that we're not involved in any of the, the low key civil war. That's Do I want to know what I'll you're tell you off about? the air? I will tell you off the air. <laughs> I did okay. see that. I you saw it. That. Okay. <laughs> yep. All right. I look forward to hearing about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, this was awesome, man. Give me, okay. Before I let you, a very, very last thing. Um, what is, is there one? realistic thing that you think that has a prayer of happening semi-realistic don't you don't have to ground yourself too much semi-realistic like within the bounds of reason that you could see that you would want to happen before either before it's a trade before the deadline something you'd want to see tibbs do like anything i mean it's going to be unoriginal and it's just going to be trading julius random before the trade deadline i mean i would also throw in the hartenstein thing in there as well like i have started to move on that part of the bandwagon and, you know, having this conversation about opening up space for Obi at the five in minutes that don't include Julius Randle. That's really appealing to me. So, you know, either one of those, I think making a deal for, for either one of those guys, Julius, I would give anything to have that happen. I've wanted it for two years now. So like, but you know, one of those things happening. I also want to say, I, I'm starting to think the, the, you know, the last thing I want to say is that I must have the best hair at KFS now, right? Do we do we agree with that or hands now, down? When, when was there competition? Yeah. Well, now that I'm here, I mean, before oh, me, yeah. I don't know yes. who it was, but you know, jump to the front of the line. Yes. Okay, that's. Very I just want to so. confirm that. All right, sounds good. Yes, and yeah, I know, and I love that in your in your Twitter. It's called the Avatar, right? Correct. Av yeah. yeah, Avi, Avi as the, the Avi. Yeah, the Avi. There you go. Yeah, no, I know. I like hip. <laughs> Listen, I gotta stay down with the lingo. Did you ask a student today who Bobby Schmurda is, by the way? <laughs> no. Okay. And I will not. It's you a, will what, not. A, what a stupid fucking name. Okay. Schmurda? Schmurda. Yes. XJ knows why that's funny. <laughs> this is what they are called today. We grew up on someone whose name was Old Dirty Bastard. What are you talking about? It's and that's a crew. cool fucking name. Okay. Well, to mm. the kids today, that name Schmurda is cool. Sinus <laughs> I, I I weep for the youth. Uh huh. 
All right. <laughs> Actually, this is great. Everybody out there, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. We'll be back with uh, pregame uh, right uh, early, uh, bright yes. early on. Yes, on, on Saturday for the Dallas Mavs, uh, postgame for Dallas, and then pregame for Cleveland. And then Jeremy and I will be doing. Are we doing our post game show after the Cavs Monday? Jeremy's well, going to the game on Sunday. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so I will be doing a post game show for Cleveland, and then me and Jeremy will do be doing our usual spot on Monday. Uh, stay tuned for all that. Uh, we will see you soon. Peace out.